Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ask a Property Manager, episode number 16. Today is May 6, 2020. We're coming to you live from the Own Buffalo Studios, Studio 1.0 here at Own Buffalo. I'm Andrew Schultz, Principal Broker of Own Buffalo, Inc. And on today's show, we're going to be discussing your property management and real estate investing questions. Before we jump into that, we're going to plug our social media. New episodes of Ask a Property Manager drop every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern. These are live on our Facebook page at that time, facebook.com slash buffalo foreclosed homes. You can also find us on Instagram, instagram.com slash own buffalo. That's been up for a couple of weeks now, and actually it's uh, growing pretty quick, so we're happy to see that. You can also subscribe to our YouTube page. If you miss an episode of Ask a Property Manager, you can find the replays on our YouTube page usually the same day. You can also find them on our Facebook page. Um, but to hit our YouTube page, you can either go to YouTube and search for Own Buffalo, or you can head over to ownbuffalo.com and click the link. Last but not least, I did want to mention that May is here. If you have tenants that have not paid May rent, uh, or if you still have tenants who haven't paid April, you can grab a free 30-minute consultation with me over at ownbuffalo.com. Uh, I do have a couple of slots open for this week, both tomorrow and Friday. And then for the following week, I have several time slots open as well. Definitely take advantage of that if you're in a situation where you um, are dealing with a tenant problem and you, and you need some help. Reach out. Let me see what I can do to help you. Maybe I can at least give you some ideas that get you back on the right path. Uh, and hopefully we are able to help. So today we are going to be answering five questions. Um, these are questions that were pulled from the Rent Prep from Landlords Facebook group. You can find that on Facebook just by searching for Rent Prep for Landlords. If you're not a member, definitely take a look at that group. Um, it's currently at 12,000 members strong and growing. It's a huge resource, especially if you are a uh, small-time landlord, maybe you only have one or two properties. A lot of great people in there that can answer questions if you ask them. Worth taking a look. Um, because it is a private group on Facebook, um, the conversations in there are not publicly visible on people's Facebook walls and things like that. That being said, never post a question online if you don't want somebody else to see it. You are posting it in, you know, on Facebook. It's a public forum. Uh, the chances of somebody seeing it that you don't want to while in a private group are definitely less. It's not impossible. Um, so definitely keep in mind when you're asking questions what you're asking and where you're asking it. Um, but because it is a private Facebook group, I did go ahead and scrub the names and photos off the questions as we're going through here, um, just, for, just for their safety more than anything else. So all that being said, let's jump right in. The first question, kind of asked if he can plant tomatoes somewhere near the dumpster in the back. Is that a reasonable request? My answer would be probably yes. That's a pretty reasonable request. If a tenant wants to grow some tomato plants or have a small garden or something like that. One thing that was mentioned in the comments on this uh, question was to request the tenant put them into pots. That makes them much easier to move from location to location. Um, it makes it easier to clean up, makes it easier to handle. And obviously they're gonna need tomato cages and, and things like that, the vine cages. So, you know, as long as the tenant is taking care of the tomato plants, I think it's a great, a great idea. It makes them, makes them happy. It makes them feel like their house is a home. It'll probably lead to a longer term tenant, and as long as the tenant is managing them the way that they should be managed, they shouldn't be too much of an issue. So on something like that, I would say, yeah, go ahead, talk to the tenant, say, as long as you're maintaining them, I have no problem with it. Now let's jump into the next question. Uh, I think I know the answer, but do any of you allow in-ground fire pits? This is an example of a question that you should answer no to every single time. There's never a situation where a tenant having a fire pit does not result in a liability for the landlord. Um, it doesn't even have to be a major fire to turn into a big situation. All it takes is one loose ember um, to hit a dry pile of leaves, um, to hit a tree in a neighboring property, something silly like that. Doesn't even have to be a big fire. It could be a very small contained, what I would call like a backyard campfire type of a thing. Uh, it's very easy for a loose ember to get out, get away from somebody and really cause a, a huge issue. So my answer to that question is always a resounding no. I don't want tenants to have fire pits at our properties. Uh, and we found tenants that have had fire pits at our properties. We physically um, remove the fire pit. Like, so if they set up like a bunch of uh, rocks in a circle to put a fire pit in or something like that, 
we'll take the rocks away and backfill the fire pit so that they can't uh, put another fire in there without doing some work. We really don't want fires at properties. That's a situation where I would issue a, a letter to the tenant so that you have something in writing telling them, no, you're not allowed to have that fire pit. Uh, if they already have it, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a cure notice. If they don't already have it, if they've just come to you and asked the question, can I have a fire pit? I would put the response in writing so that it's, you know, verifiable that this was a conversation that was had. This was the official response that you were given. You know that you're not allowed to have the fire pit. Cover yourself that way. So those were the first two questions. Those were kind of softballs. This one's a little bit more tricky. I wanted to see if given the choice, would you continue... Uh, I'm sorry, would you recommend continuing to grow slowly by acquiring one to two properties each year, start paying off properties, or go all in buying one property per month? There's not enough information here to really answer this question. I don't know what kind of a capital pool you're dealing with. Um, it, I, I'm assuming you don't have unlimited money. I'm assuming at some point the money's going to run out. So I guess the question becomes, do I build this portfolio quickly? Do I build this portfolio slowly? And that boils down to um, a lot of different criteria that it's basically how you want to set up your your real estate portfolio um, it depends largely on your goals there's just not enough information here to give a super clear answer some people really enjoy the freedom of owning a property outright so they'll buy it with cash they know that they don't have that mortgage um, so after they go ahead and pay their their taxes and their uh, other expenses insurance management maintenance upkeep capital expenditures things like that Everything that comes out at the end of the day, that's considered profit to them. Um, that's fine if that's the way you want to go. That's fine if you have a giant pile of cash to throw at a property. I guess the one nice thing about having a property that is 100% paid off is you're sitting on a ton of equity. So if you ever get to a point where you need access to capital, you can probably pull it back out from your property. Um, that being said, it also means that you're sitting on a ton of debt equity that's not doing anything to help you grow your portfolio. If you're, you know, at the end stages of your portfolio growth and you're not looking to grow more, okay, that makes sense. If you're in a position where you're trying to grow your portfolio, then I think leverage is probably the much better scenario for you. Um, some people would prefer to go in with the bare minimum down payment that they have to put down. I typically would recommend against a scenario like that. Um, the landlords that I'm talking to right now that went in and put the bare minimum down, uh, you know, some of them bought four units, lived in one unit for a year and bought it on an FHA mortgage with, with three and a half percent down. Now they're struggling. Uh, all it takes is one or two tenants to stop paying in a small building like that. Um, and it's now you're, now you're struggling and you may not have equity in your building to be able to go and pull out cash if you need to make a big repair or something like that. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think that going all cash is always the best scenario. I also don't think that going, you know, as, as much leverage as you can is the great scenario. I think the best move is to be somewhere in the middle. Um, even like most investment products, and we're seeing a big change in the market for investment uh, products right now. Uh, most investment products that banks are selling are requiring 20 to 25% down payment. Don't be afraid to say, I don't want to put... Uh, you know, 25% down, I want to put 40, 50% down. The more you're putting down on the asset, the less that asset is leveraged. And in a situation like what we're dealing with right now, not being leveraged too, too far, like beyond your means, is really, really, really critical in a situation like what we're dealing with right now. So that would probably be my recommendation is if you are looking to continue to buy, um, I would buy with some kind of leverage if you can, you know, if you can uh, go that route. Um, cash purchases, sure, if that's really what you're looking to do. Um, it's not my personal investment strategy. I don't think that going all cash is the best move. There are times when all cash makes sense if you're in a hot market and it's multiple offers. Maybe you have to go in all cash to get the deal and then refinance it after you close, something like that. There are times when all cash deals make sense, but as far as having an asset that you're holding for a long term and just letting it sit there uh, without any kind of without any kind of leverage against it, Typically not what I would want to do. Um, so ultimately, your investment strategy is going to depend on what your goals are. Uh, there's a lot of different methods out there and everybody's strategy is a little bit different because everybody's lifestyle is a little bit different. So ultimately, that's what it's going to boil down to is building your investment portfolio around the lifestyle that you're looking to have um, and, and, and managing the properties in the way that you see fit. 
uh, that would be my recommendation is to figure out exactly what your personal strategy is and then build your portfolio around that strategy. Next question, denying an applicant. If a denied applicant asks for specifics regarding a bad reference, who said what, do you share that info? Uh, the answer to that question is no, absolutely not. We send a very, very basic generic uh, adverse action letter, which is required. I'm actually gonna show you our adverse action letter here. Let me jump back to desktop. So this is the adverse action letter that we send. It's a very simple form fill PDF. Um, we fill in the contact info for the uh, person here. Obviously, it's very straightforward. Thank you for your recent rental application. After a review of the provided information, we find we are unable to accept your application at this time. If checked, this decision was based in whole or in part on the information provided, uh, provided to us. I gotta fix that. Got a little typo there provided to us in a consumer report or investigative consumer report paired for us by a consumer reporting agency. Their address and phone number are listed below, Fidelis Screening Solutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is an adverse action letter. This is a properly formatted, with the exception of my one typo, adverse action letter. This is the only thing that we send to an applicant when they are denied. Uh, we don't give them specific reasons. We're not required to give specific reasons in this state. Um, so I don't see a reason to overexpose myself by giving any more information than I absolutely have to. The less you can say when denying an applicant, the better off you are. Um, as far as telling them what references said what, those references are giving you that information and confidence for the most part. Um, and this is, a, this is an ongoing situation throughout the industry. The reason that people don't like to give rental references is because people turn around and say, well, your previous landlord said you didn't pay rent for six months and blah, blah. Don't do that. It makes the whole industry suffer. Hold your cards close to your chest. Send the adverse action letter that you're required to send by law. Don't give out more information than you're required to give out and leave it at that. Uh, I will mention that, you know, uh, if you run the credit check, you do have to notify the tenant or the, I'm sorry, the applicant that they are uh, eligible for a free copy of their report. Um, if you are doing these credit and background checks, chances are the company you're doing those through will have an adverse action letter that you can that you can use, some kind of a template letter or something along those lines. So that's something to keep in mind. The only thing that we send when it comes to uh, the only thing that it sent that we send when it comes to denying an applicant is that adverse action letter. We don't go any further than that. If the tenant calls us or the applicant calls us screaming bloody murder about uh, you know why was I denied? Why was I denied? Blah blah blah. We tell them, you know, we've we've already explained in the selection process. And, and, and by the way, it's important to note that like when someone signs up and uh, signs an application for, for Own Buffalo, they've already looked at our application criteria because it's the first thing that they have to sign when they start the application process. So they already know what our criteria is before they even get to the application. So they have the opportunity to opt out there before they go through the process, before they spend money on the application fee, uh, before they spend a couple of days waiting for the application to be screened and come back, they already know what the criteria are. So they should have a pretty good idea whether or not they're going to qualify before they even go through the process. Um, so if they've reached the process, uh, you can refer them back to your written criteria. That's always a good option. Um, and then, you know, just send them that adverse action letter. Make sure that you're remaining compliant by sending them that adverse action letter and go from there. Uh, one good point that was brought to me by Brad Larson over at RentWorks in Texas, um, really neat idea, that's something that I had never thought of, uh, and he mentioned it to me once at a conference, and then he actually mentioned it in a podcast that he had, I think last week, um, Property Management Mastermind Podcast. If you're not listening to that, definitely tune in for that one. It's a great podcast. But one of the things that Brad had mentioned was when they send their adverse action letters, they already have, in 95% of instances, they already have the email address for the applicant because they applied online. Um, what he'll do is their company will send the adverse action letter through DocuSign, AuthentiSign, um, whatever you're using to do digital signatures. They'll send it out through that software package because what happens is when the person, the applicant clicks on the link to read the update on their application and they see that adverse action letter, they don't have to sign anything. Uh, they don't have to click anything, but because they clicked on that link, it automatically updates the system to show that they received that document. So now there's never a question of, hey, I didn't receive my adverse action letter. What kind of a, a stunt are you guys pulling? 
Well, I can show you that you did see it because you opened the link that we sent you on, you know, May 6th at 10.15 in the morning. You clicked on that link. So I know that you saw the, the adverse action letter. It eliminates the, the option for someone to say, well, they didn't follow the process by, of law. They didn't send me the adverse action letter. No, we sent it and we have proof that we sent it because you clicked on this and uh, we have that record. So kind of a neat idea if you're, if you're doing uh, landlording at scale, you're doing something where you have a situation where you're doing like digital signatures, really good way to protect yourself when sending one of those adverse action letters is to send it digitally and that way you always have a record as to whether or not that person received it. So that's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool tip from Brad that I will share with you guys here. Uh, on to the next question, tenant shut off gas. This is in Iowa uh, and they're under a no eviction order until May 27th. The tenant canceled the gas and it transferred to my name as part of the landlord agreement with the gas company. He's not moving out. Uh, I asked him what's going, what he's going to do about heat and a gas stove with no gas and he has not responded yet. I'm tempted to have the gas turned off. What are your thoughts? My first thought is do not turn off that gas service. Uh, this is a few. Uh, this question is a few days old, but uh, do not turn off that gas service. Turning off that gas service after it's been rolled back to your name as the landlord could be considered the beginning of a constructive criticism. You're basically leaving a tenant without the ability to heat water, uh, or heat the home, uh, or cook if you turn that gas service off. Understandably, the service is supposed to be in the tenant's name. Uh, but when that rolls back to your name, hey, it's still your asset. You still have to protect it. You really, I mean, I don't know what the weather is in Iowa at the moment, but do you really want to be in a situation where you wind up with damages to your asset because there's no heat or no hot water and a pipe freezes or whatever the case may be? Um, don't shut off the gas service. You're better off leaving the gas service on and continuing to pay for it under your name uh, even if the tenant never pays you a dime back just to protect your asset, you're better off leaving that gas service on. So that being said, hopefully you have a way to back bill the gas bill to the tenant in your lease. Uh, this is one of the most common things that comes up when we talk about leases. Having a mechanism by which to back bill a tenant for tenant caused damages, um, tenant, tenant utilities, things like that. Having some sort of a clause in your lease that allows you to back bill that stuff to the tenant and put it on their ledger is huge. Um, make sure you have that in your lease going forward if you don't have it in your lease already. Uh, if you don't have it in your lease already, you're gonna be in a rough spot. Uh, if you do have it in your lease already, go ahead, back bill it to the tenant, put it on their ledger. I can't tell from this question. It sounds like this person's probably not paying rent already. So it sounds like this is probably heading toward an eviction. Uh, but the other option that you have would be Try offering the tenant a cash for keys, do a cash for keys arrangement, tell them if they're gone by X date and the house is broom clean, that you'll return X amount of dollars of their security deposit or whatever. It gets them out of your place. You know, have them sign an agreement at the time that they move out that they are relinquishing their rights to the property back to you um, for whatever the amount of money is that you're doing for the cash for keys. Cash for keys is one of those things that it burns every time you have to do it, but you get your asset back, you get to get in there, turn it over and get it back on the market to get a paying tenant back in there. Sometimes you have to bite the bullet and go that route. Um, otherwise you're gonna be going to eviction court. By the question here, it says that May, uh, May 27th will be the day that the eviction order opens up. Keep in mind that they're gonna start back on the cases that were uh, filed before this whole thing started. So you're probably not going to see the inside of a courtroom for a couple of months uh, at the earliest. Eviction is probably going to be a prolonged process going forward for, for the next several months. So cash for keys might be a better option for landlords who are in the process of or know, know that they need to evict a tenant but don't want to have to wait to go through that whole process. You might be able to find a tenant who will just go away if you offer them the cash for keys scenario. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I think we'll probably do an episode with a little bit more in-depth look at how cash for keys works and maybe show you a cash for keys agreement. Uh, if that's something you guys would be interested in, drop it down in the comments below. That would be awesome. That'll help us kind of guide our content a little bit to uh, show what you guys are interested in. That being said, guys, we are pretty much wrapped up here today. Uh, thanks so much for watching. I love producing Ask a Property Manager and you can help me to improve it. Drop a question in the comments either here on Facebook or on YouTube and your question may be answered in an upcoming episode. 
If you enjoyed this content or if I brought some value to your day, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. YouTube and Facebook both push videos based on community feedback, and we want to be able to help as many people as possible to find us. If you found us, if you found the content useful, there's probably somebody on your uh, news feed that would find us useful as well. Feel free to share our videos. We would greatly appreciate it. Uh, next week's topic, May 13, 10 a.m., right back here on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash buffalo foreclosed homes. We'll have our next episode of Ask a Property Manager, and next week's topic is an investment property analysis. So if you've got a property that you need an analysis done on, reach out today and we may feature it on next week's episode. We'll get a chance to plug the rest of our social media here. You can follow us on Instagram at instagram.com slash own buffalo. Subscribe to us on YouTube. You can either go to YouTube and search for own buffalo, or you can grab the link off of our Facebook page at ownbuffalo.com. And as always, feel free to grab your free 30-minute phone consultation over at ownbuffalo.com as well. Uh, guys, that's not a sales pitch. That's literally me just offering to help as many people as I can. Makes me feel good to help people. Uh, so if you have a situation and you don't know what to do, grab one of those consultations and I'll do whatever I can to help you. Thanks so much for watching and we will see you next week.